I have to, I have to sort of, uh, I, I would like to echo what Ambassador Becker said. This is the first conference where I've had an audience of teddy bears. And I, I really think we should do this more often. It's really <laughs> delightful when you're, when you're up on stage to look at an audience of teddy bears. They're very receptive and they love everything you say. <laughs> it's really nice. <laughs> so, so welcome back. Um, I am really, really pleased to share this stage with not only colleagues, but dear friends on this stage. Um, so really happy to have all of you here. And I need uh, to tell you that there is, um, I'm sorry that you're seeing me again, yet again on this stage, because in fact, um, uh, Ashley Namiro, who is an MHPSS advisor with the Collaborative and our lead on education and emergencies and youth livelihoods, should be sitting here. But she is in her third trimester, so she is an expecting mom. And we thought it best uh, for her to stay back. So I will try to fill her shoes. That's not easy to do. Um, and just to say that the collaborative feels like we're having a baby. So we're very <laughs> excited about this. This is our first collaborative baby. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but let me tell you who Ashley is. Well, I did just tell you who Ashley is, so, so you know. Um, and let me introduce our, our wonderful panel. So um, first, Dr. Vitsa Toll is a professor in global mental health at the section of global health, the Department of Public Health at Copenhagen University. We're really happy that you've moved to Denmark, Vitsa. <laughs> we, we couldn't be happier. And you're also program director of the Peter C. Alderman Program for Global Mental Health at HealthRight International and associate at the Department of Mental Health at jo Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So thank you for being here. Sarah Harrison, who is also my neighbor yes. uh, here in, in Copenhagen, is uh, a technical mental health and psychosocial support advisor at the IFRC, the world's largest humanitarian organization, and also, I think has been mentioned already, that you're the co-chair of our reference group, the Interagency Standing Committee Group on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support in Emergencies, and you have held that on behalf of IFRC since February of 2016. And we're, we're very happy with you and family as our co-chairs. Thank you. So delighted with all the all hard work you do for us and for all the crises in the world. And Anne-Sophie Dibdi, my uh, office mate, is Senior Child Protection Advisor with the MHPSS Unit of Save the Children Denmark. And I want to say a little bit about you, Anne-Sophie, um, because you had quite a career before this. Um, as, as a child psychologist and specialist in child development, but you began your work with Save the Children in 2007 um, with efforts in Haiti, Somaliland, Sierra Leone, the West Bank, Lebanon, Jordan, and South Sudan, and you've been ensuring the protection of children, working to secure the best possible conditions for them to grow and thrive, and you are also, I didn't know this before, the co-author of 14 textbooks, as well as numerous online materials that focus on this important work, so thank you. Um, I am going to lead off um, with uh, letting you know about some research that we're engaged in, and, and then I'm going to move to Vitsa, because in fact, these are sister research projects. They're both ELRA-funded projects, um, and I am going to read carefully from the notes that Ashley prepared for me, so this is her presentation that I'll deliver on her behalf. Okay, great. Um, and if it's all right with everybody, if you don't mind, I'm also going to stand up just so I can be sure that I do see the slides well. Okay. So this is a research project that uh, it's funded by ELRA, and we are partnered with Anthrologica on this research project. And it is a review and assessment of MHPSS intervention research over the last decades in humanitarian settings. And let me just go here, right. Um, before I get to this slide, just let me give you a little more information about sort of what came before. Um, in 2011, 
there were recommendations of an interdisciplinary group, and they identified this clear need to generate useful evidence that could be translated to MHPSS programming. And Bitsa, you were um, a big part of that. And that agenda was set, and it included five priority research areas and 10 priority questions. So since that agenda was set, there's been a great increase in the, the body of relevant MHPSS research, which is wonderful. But systematic reviews of the interventions in humanitarian settings um, sh are still showing an evidence gap. So that's the difficulty, particularly with the more commonly used interventions that are broad-based community interventions. For those of us who know the pyramid, we're talking about layers one and two of the IASC pyramid. Um, so this study is to examine the extent that the research generated from 2010 has contributed to this evidence base um, and influenced also programming and policy. And it is making recommendations based on those findings on how we can better do those things. Um, and then we will also come to Vitsa in a moment to talk about the agenda for the next decade, which is what your research will be about. Um, so what we have done uh, is, is in three stages. We reviewed uh, the published literature, the studies of MHPSS, the, those studies of MHPSS interventions over the last decade. We also looked at what is called R2HC funded MHPSS literature, and then did a consultation process, and that was interviews with researchers, practitioners, both country level and headquarter based governments, donors, coordinators, and we also conducted a survey of practitioners and researchers. Okay. And we have some key recommendations, and I hope I'm not going to drop anything as I do that. All right. Um, so some of the findings here is that there has been a major change in the knowledge and attitudes of donors and governments and implementing agencies. There, there is a kind of waking up as we build this evidence base. And there has been influence from this operational research on programmatic changes and uptake for several interventions, but sometimes that becomes quite specific to the certain interventions that are being researched. So some of those are the scalable interventions from WHO. Um, there has been a broadening in the scope and range of how we begin to do this measurement in research. Um, so moving from sort of language of trauma and dysfunction to a language that's more positive about uh, how we measure outcomes and more attention to context. So sort of more resilience-based and more attention to context. Um, and MHPSS research has influenced policy changes. And what is across the board important is researcher and practitioner collaborations from everybody that we interviewed. That when you can get the researchers together with the people who are implementing the programs, um, that's the most effective way, both to shape how research is done, but also ways to truly use the findings for um, impacting on the ground. Um, however, there is still this kind of dis disconnect between country-level practitioners and researchers. So several of the recommendations are about that. I think I might have skipped some slides. Yes? Okay. Sorry about that. This could be the findings, but that gives me a chance to sit down with my colleagues. So let me get to the recommendations, which I think is actually this slide. Um, the research needs to be... We, we need to prioritize practice-based research. So it needs to be better informed by the practitioners who are working in humanitarian crises so they can help shape the agenda and, and including them as active participants throughout the whole process in the design um, and, th and through every stage and then also interpreting those findings. And um, there is a need also to support the development of stronger practice-based research including impactful interventions during humanitarian crises that are not necessarily randomized control design, but really looking at sort of what are the interventions we're doing? Can we begin to research those? And strong collaborations are the foundation, as I said. So it, that includes um, better 
inclusion and engagement of people with lived experience. Um, and that would be the best way that we can uh, shape and implement research and really make sure the knowledge is being used um, on the ground. As you see, it's people like David who joined us who are on the front lines and really engaged directly. So if we can do this better, we will have greater impact. And, uh, and that is actually another one of the important points is engagement in research led by youth and local researchers so that we can get, um, start to eliminate those geographical and generational inequities. So we need to create the resources and the pathways and the opportunities for that to happen and for us to do the knowledge translation where we can sit with people um, and make sure that people are understanding in both sides. The practitioners are understanding the research and the researchers are understanding what that means on the ground and the interpretation of that. And with that, improving access, um, ways that we can do that are through online communities that already exist. MHPSS.net, for example, is, is our hub uh, where we all go. Um, MHinnovation.net, um, mental health innovation. Um, if we can get some working groups and clusters using these online platforms, um, and begin to facilitate some of that dialogue. And since we are now all so much more working remotely, I think this is more realistic in our minds as something we can really do to begin to foster those dialogues. Online conferences around research would be great with practitioners and country. Okay? And then it's building the knowledge and skills to understand and use research. Um, and this needs to be this equitable mutual process. Um, of co-producing the research, but also, as I described, the capacity building needs to be bi-directional. And that also fits with ELRA's principles of partnership. And lastly, and this also came up in our consultation process, was building the skills of research to translate their findings into policy. Okay. Um, and all of this really is coming at the last recommendation. It's that systematically monitoring how we're doing that knowledge brokering, how we're using that knowledge and the impact that that's having. Um, we do have some specific recommendations for funders and policymakers. Um, and uh, those that fund MHPSS research, and we feel that they can really have a major and po po uh, positive influence if they can create the systems that demand and measure knowledge brokering. Okay, so if we're actually measuring how well we're doing in research projects in doing that engagement, that would, that would uh, um, move the field forward and make collaboration and capacity building mandatory. Ensure the flexibility in the project in terms of the times, activities, and budget so that there's enough budget for the uptake of research. And ensure community and youth engagement is a core requirement. Um, align programming and research funding structures so that we're doing the best we can for programmers and we need to fund these learning institutions and hubs to collate and make accessible these bodies of evidence. I hope, Ashley, if you're watching, that I did that justice. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd like to move to Witsa now, if I can, and there's a new slide set that we'll be bringing up. Thank you. Um, so. Vitsa, um, I know that you're going to give an overview now. This is sort of what we found out of the previous 10 years and then the next 10 years coming. And can you tell us more about the process that you're envisioning as we go about that work? For the research agenda in the sure. next 10 years? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I think I was asked to prepare some words around sure. uh, what has MHPSS research really done for us. Um, but first, Thank you uh, for the invitation and the store to Lüge for to everybody at uh, Save the Children for your 75th anniversary. Thank you. So I, yeah, I had the audacity to put up a MHPSS research scorecard on a slide, but I do want to put the disclaimer out there that uh, it's a broad field uh, and a dynamic field. So this is my interpretation. Blame me, not the field, if you think that this is... Um, going in the wrong direction. On the left, left, I put the scorecard elements that I think are positive, where we've had 
major successes. Uh, let's start there. Um, I think the number of high quality studies has really greatly increased over the last two uh, and last decade. Um, I think what we've done well as a research community is that we have very clearly established a need for MHPSS interventions. I don't think anybody on the basis of the existing evidence should have any doubts in their minds that this is an absolutely critical, life-saving and life and thrive-saving field. I think there's been more of a diversity in the type of research that's being done, whereas maybe um, in the early 90s, a lot of research was very heavily focused on measuring post-traumatic stress symptoms and depression symptoms using symptom checklists. I think you see now a much more broader kind of research agenda that includes resilience and protective measures and social determinants and um, more intervention-focused research. I think a major plus of the research in the last decade has been how we've helped the MHPSS community in terms of its use of information. Um, so through the ISC reference group, guides have come out for monitoring and evaluation, also for needs assessment. So beyond just academic research published in peer-reviewed papers, how we've worked together with the practice and policy community to think about the role of information more broadly. I think we've had some successes there. Um, and definitely over the last decade, I think there's been a big increase in um, evaluations of interventions. So we have a body of evidence to go to a donor with and say what we do works. It's a bit lopsided, but it is definitely a growing area. Where I think there are still important gaps is uh, what you were also saying, is there are gaps between research and practice. Um, we may know which interventions work, but we don't always know how we can scale those up in uh, routine humanitarian, well, in routine practice settings. Um, we talk a lot about research to practice, but we don't always talk about practice to research. So we still, I think, need to push the academy a bit more towards thinking about the questions that matter for people on the ground rather than the people reviewing journal papers. Um, and to do that, I think we need better partnerships between practitioners and researchers and policy makers. A big gap, as you noted, is uh, research at the bottom of the pyramid to understand how effective our layer one, layer two interventions are. I think we can learn much more about how we can build on existing local practices, traditional religious healing practices. Um, and one thing that I'm particularly concerned about, uh, and it's been mentioned quite a bit already today, um, research to support how we can work across sectors. Uh, the problem that the humanitarian world faces in terms of its cluster-specific and isolated interventions, the academic world doesn't necessarily contribute to solutions for that because we tend to live in our little disciplines and hallways um, as well. So more multidisciplinary research on multi-sectoral care, I think, would be very helpful. So then quickly, um, the next research agenda um, follows MHZ. You might have gone to the other direction, into the past rather than the future. It's, it's okay, I, I can, uh, I should know this by heart. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's, it's a hint, I get it. Um, so this, uh, it's called MHPSS set Mental Health and Psychosocial Support, uh, consensus-based research priority setting for the next 10 years, follows MHZ, is funded by ELRA, the Research for Health and Humanitarian Crisis Program. Um, what we would like to do is set a research agenda for the next 10 years that's based on consensus. Um, we want to highlight the key research questions for the next 10 years. Um, and we don't want to do that as an isolated group of researchers sitting in Copenhagen, New York, or Brussels, or, or, or wherever, Kampala. Um, so there are three components to the work. One is a, a social media component where, uh, sorry, uh, first is a qualitative consultation uh, where we would like to hear the voice of people working on the ground, uh, but also people with lived experience, people affected by humanitarian crises, um, because participation, meaningful participation is important. We'd like to do that in three countries, Lebanon, the Philippines, and Uganda, to understand 
from the perspective of people working on the ground, participating in MHP assess interventions, what are the key knowledge needs? Um, that will be open-ended. A social media component, we'd like to develop a do-it-yourself tool that can, that uh, in-country coordination groups can use. And we'd like to do a more standard panel consultation where we ask a group of uh, panel members, uh, research, policy, practice experts to tell us what the most important research questions are. And there's a structured way of consulting and developing consensus around that. Uh, and this is an initiative under the auspices of the ISC reference group. That's different from the last time. Uh, what's also different from the last time is that we've collected um, a group of funding and policy council members to build more ownership at that level also uh, around the research priorities. Okay, thank, thank you. you. It's exciting. We look forward to that. Me too. Yeah, yeah thank you. Great. Um, I'd like to move on to Sarah now. And Sarah, I think that you're going to speak about the achievements and challenges in mainstreaming MHPSS across sectors from your role as co-chair and also these specific efforts towards um, coordination, including the various um, resources and the way that we worked uh, through COVID-19. Um, I think um, as a community, the MHPSS community was never so busy as <laughs> when COVID-19 hit. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, th I think that there's a lot of rich lessons there and a lot of interesting and innovative resources that came out. So the floor is yeah. yours. Thank you, Lacey, and thank you, uh, Save the Children Denmark and the Collaborative for the invitation. It's nice when you're based in Denmark and you don't have to travel to a lovely event like this. So thank you. Um, in December last year, in 2019, the IASC principles, um, which is the kind of highest policy-making humanitarian body um, uh, within the United Nations anyway, um, it's based in New York and in Geneva. And at that meeting, it's the heads of all the UN agencies, the operational agencies, uh, the World Bank, and uh, also the Secretary General and the Director Generals of IFRC, the Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies, and the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the World Bank sit. So it's quite high level. And at that meeting, they decided that MHPSS was a cross-cutting issue across the whole of humanitarian response. Um, and that was in, um, explicitly, actually, because of the strong support and persistent humanitarian diplomacy from, from the Dutch government, for which we're grateful. Um, but that, that then has to be put into practice. And it's something that we've been long advocating for for a number of years. And um, designating it as a cross-cutting issue does not make it happen overnight. And the challenge we have with MHPSS, and particularly for children and families, is that, that the responsibility for the outcome, the positive outcome of a child, so meaning that a child can, can live and can thrive, sits across multiple sectors. Um, and the same for if you take a family. And the way that the humanitarian system is structured is it's done um, under, under areas like health, um, protection, nutrition, education, and you've also got logistics, camp management, food security, and, and a number of others. But what um, many organizations are trying to do is to have is their population focus as children, which means that you have to work across multiple sectors or multiple clusters to achieve improved well-being, to achieve reduced stress levels, to, to enable the, there to be an environment for a child to thrive. So in practical terms, at country level, that means that uh, if you are an organization providing MHPSS programs, um, either through in partnership with the government or directly or through volunteers, you have to be able to go out and basically hustle. You have to go to the education cluster and you have to make your case and you have to say that MHPSS is a core part of your job. Um, teachers need to be able to know how to work with children who have suffered from conflict, who are scared, who are frightened, who are unable to learn within the classroom environment. The classroom environment needs to be physically safe, it needs to be free from landmines, it needs to be not bombed or attacked in emergency settings in order to create that safe learning environment. It means going to the protection cluster and advocating with people providing victim assistance to, to people suffered from landmines or unexplosive ordnance that they need that children, a, a victim um, who's stepped on a landmine, which are disproportionately children around the world, that they have access 
to appropriate care, appropriate psychological support, having just stepped on a landmine. And it means that you use mine action as a way to clear schools, to clear the safe spaces for children to be able to move around in their communities. It means going to the health cluster and saying, why are you not prioritizing child health? Why is this not an issue? Why is child mental health not being raised here? Um, yes, it's fine to talk about your vaccination campaigns, um, but there's also children here, some of you have pre-existing mental health conditions, so children um, with epilepsy, for example, children that might be born with intellectual disability. Why are they, these children not on your agenda? Or why are the carers, the family members of these children, not on your agenda within the health cluster? And it means also going to the nutrition cluster and saying that you provide uh, infant feeding supplements, uh, you provide spaces for, for mothers to, to learn how to breastfeed and to resume lactation, but where's the MHPSS element? Where's the interaction between the mother and the child or the parent and the child? It's not about giving plumpy nut, it's about creating that safe space, it's about enabling mothers, some of whom might have extreme anxiety themselves or be suffering from depression, it's about enabling them to resume lactating. It's enabling them to have the skills again to appropriately care for their infant child. So there shouldn't be an infant feeding space anywhere in the world where there is not an MHPSS component. And in some cases that requires extra staffing, yes. It requires you having a social worker or a psychosocial worker. Um, but in most cases, it actually requires us to work with the existing workforce in the country, be it a pediatric nurse, um, a doctor in a primary healthcare center, or a, a person clearing landmines, or a teacher, and it's about giving them the skills to, in order to be able to integrate MHPSS in the work that they do. So it's, it's across multiple sectors, and the challenge is that the humanitarian community is not very receptive to cross-cutting issues, unless you can fill it in a tick box check, like the gender marker, that some of you might be familiar with where you have to prove that your programs are reaching men, women, girls, and boys uh, in a, in a gender-sensitive lens. You can't do that with MHPSS. It's not a tick box exercise. Um, so the, the space at the country level where all of this comes together is, is the MHPSS working groups or the MHPSS technical working groups. And that's the space where you have the forum for the technical discussions to say, what do we need to do as MHPSS community in this emergency, in this crisis, to lift it? And what's the messages we need to give to the education cluster, to the protection cluster, to health, to education, to nutrition, um, to, to ensure that MHPSS is on their agenda and that they are able to integrate it and incorporate it within the work that they do. Um, and a lot of it is about communication. And as I said, it's about going out there and basically hustling and advocating for your cause and why those other clusters and sectors should listen to you. So it's about making the case um, as well. And it's also about working with the existing workforce. So in, in countries, that means working across multiple ministries. It would be lovely if there's a ministry for MHPSS that isn't in the world. You have to go to the Ministry of Education, you have to go to the Ministry of Health, the Social Welfare Ministry, and, you have to, and the Labour Ministry in some cases, and you have to sit down and make your case to them. Um, and that, again, requires a lot of coordination, and that happens at country level in these technical spaces with the working groups. But it's a huge challenge. We have a very pillared, siloed humanitarian system, a humanitarian cluster system, and that was completely exposed with the COVID-19 response, um, where government departments are, are being forced to work together. You've got social care workers being forced to speak to the healthcare workers. Um, in countries and being forced to speak with the education system that's been massively impacted with children out of school. And it, it's one of the rare crises that you can really see governments having to work out, how am I going to speak to another ministry? And that's also happening at the cluster and sector level. How are we going to produce a humanitarian response plan that actually is truly multi-sectoral um, and is not, not just looking at my sector, my cluster? Um, in, in their respective chapters, and that's a big challenge. Um, yeah, it's a big challenge. It's a lot of work that needs to be done. Mm, done. You. And you also asked me about the resources Yes. in relation to COVID-19. So it was a little bit of a busy year this year, and it's only September. Um, so the, the, I think the major resources that have come out this year that have had an enormous uptake 
And we know that from the numbers of resources that have been downloaded um, from the websites, and we know that from the language translations and adaptations done. And I think the, the one that's probably been most successful um, is the one that, that's also available on your tables here, the, the children's storybook, My Hero Is You, that was very much a collaborative effort um, of, of which the MHPSS Collaborative was instrumental in, in helping write the book um, and, and also the adaptations in relation to it. Um, it's now available in 127 languages, um, even languages like Esperanto. Um, as well, as well as Cornish, as Dan mentioned. Um, <laughs> and it's the book that's been translated the fastest globally. And uh, according to Wikipedia, we're in the top 15 books to have been most translated ever. So it's a little bit surprising that you, you, you don't expect it when you're working at 10 o'clock at night and you're on a Skype call with Leslie trying to work out the text, that this book is going to become this enormous, um, just, it's just multiplied. And the adaptations of it, um, there's puppet shows of it happening in Iran with, with mental health promotion with children. There's an animation that Harvard and Stanford University have done in the States. Um, it's available in Braille for, for children and whose families who might be blind. Um, it's just, it's, it's mushrooming. And I think that's, there's a lot of power behind it. Um, it wasn't the only resource. There was also key resources on the basic psychosocial skills guide, which was been quite instrumental in pushing beyond psychological first aid. Um, and that's been a concern for a number of people in this sector from a technical position is going beyond PFA. PFA is required, but what happens if you have a crisis like COVID that's stretching out for 10 months and will go on for the next two years in some parts of the world? Um, how do you equip your frontline workers, which means your grocery seller, it means your man collecting your rubbish, your delivery driver, as well as your paramedic, and your nurses and your social workers um, with the skills to be able to support somebody um, struggling. And, and again, um, the MHPSS Collaborative and Save the Children were, were key in the development of these resources within the interagency group. Um, and we also have an operational guidance note um, that was broken down into different chapters. And one chapter in that um, talks about if you are going to provide psychological first aid within the COVID time, how can you do it? How can you do it remotely? How can you do it safely? And how can you tailor it um, towards uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, as we had with Ebola, um, when there was a, a PFA that came out for Ebola virus disease, um, and I'm grateful that we had Leslie to help mm -hmm. inform that, seeing you were the author of many of the other previous And, uh, and Carmen Baia as well. Yeah, and Carmen from the collaborative yeah. as well. And I think there, the, there are other resources that have come out. Um, there's a lot that have come out this year, but they're the, the major ones I'll bring up here because it's of relevance for children and families. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's, a, it, it's unprecedented times, but there's always yeah. this opening and opportunity, which you've, yeah. you've so nicely expressed. And yeah, that's a momentum we need to continue to momentum. seize. Yeah. yeah. And continuing with innovations, um, we have a, a, a wonderful innovation that, Anne Sophie, you have been working on for quite a long time with colleagues from Japan as well, Save the Children Japan. Um, and this is the peer-to-peer -peer psychological first aid. So I understand you're going to speak with us about this uh, and where it is currently, because now it is a larger collaboration uh, with UNICEF and WHO and us as well. Um, but also, I, I understand you will move into the topic of social capital and social ecology. So. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Philip, by any chance, uh, are there any pictures of the young people? No? Okay. So you'll have to envision it. So um, if we uh, take a step back and look at what psychological first aid is from a very practical point of view, this is about social intelligence combined with knowledge. Uh, in Japan in 2016, there was a request from youth to work with um, experts on a tool that could actually be embedded in disaster risk reduction. And mind you, uh, our Japanese colleagues are excellent at disaster risk reduction. 
uh, and uh, the growing interest in, uh, in Japan and Japanese donors to look at the integration of MHPSS in um, especially earthquake-related disaster risk reduction. So with Japanese youth, we worked, well, that's quite a lot of years since it's 2016, we worked on developing a tool which was, like I say, a combination of disaster risk reduction and creating a common understanding of what are the risks and not separating the risks of earthquake and the escape routes related to earthquake from that of, for example, panic, uh, anxiety, and feelings of insecurity and lack of um, an inner locus of control in the face of uh, these reoccurring um, incidents. Um, and f in a Japanese context, this is not um, uh, limited to one single incident because it keeps happening <laughs> all the time. So this is about the longer term maintenance of uh, psychological sanity and, and good health. Um, and our, the product itself is a capacity building tool for young people from the age of nine uh, to look at developing the look, listen, link of which you are the, one of the co-original uh, authors, Leslie. But uh, translating that principle of look, listen, link into longer term systems of support between youth. And uh, youth in Mongolia have helped us develop this as well. You know, as you know, uh, youth in uh, in Mongolia, or populations in Mongolia, uh, often um, are exposed to sandstorms and extreme cold. Um, and that in itself also constitute a psychological um, risk. Um, what is interesting is not only the capacity building tool in itself, we feel, it's the philosophy and the justification behind working with children and youth to look at a handle, so to speak, a, a tool to master and be an active agent in your own environment and building the social capital of solidarity and understanding between a group of youth. Because the tool in itself is a, I mean, it's a three-day training, but uh, underneath that, the stream under that is about building your, a critical mass, and I sound like someone from the 70s, but building a critical mass of uh, interpersonal and group solidarity on which you can build your support system. So it goes beyond the techniques of look, listen, link, but looks at how we take responsibility for the environment, that we ourselves as individuals are a part of the environment that affects the others. Um, in our piloting, we have looked at how this links, and this actually talks into your agenda here, Sarah, how this links to the education sector. Because as you may know, uh, for example, in Denmark, schools have compulsory anti-bullying policies. And that is because we know that bullying is the single most uh, prevalent risk factor in our part of the world for uh, not only uh, not thriving or learning well in school, but actual mental health concerns, uh, drug abuse and substance abuse and uh, affiliation and risk of criminality. It is a very, very serious environmental risk. And looking at building that solidarity and it's not tokenism, it's not handing over the responsibility to children and youth themselves, it's working together as a community. And when I look at the recommendations here, I could see that in that philosophy, in, in that justification, we look at the uh, recommendations for engagement um, and the safe and ethical way. Yeah, It also looks at co-creation and it looks at social determinants. And it also um, attempts to make a common understanding of what, the, what are the social determinants and how can we work on creating equity between us all in a school environment. So it becomes almost a social, dare I say, movement uh, to create a healthier environment. That's so well said. Thank you so much for that. And, and I'm, I'm actually seeing that theme also 
throughout the three presentations in different ways, in research, how are we better engaging the, the, the whole environment um, to inform that. And you described it so well in terms of you visiting <laughs> different ministries, but also then on the ground, what does that mean? If those things are connected, what does that mean and, and what impact can it have on the ground? We have just about a minute, and what I would like to do, because you, all three presentations were so interesting, just if you have a final reflection or even a question for each other, um, you may express that now. <laughs> and Sophie, I, I don't know if you have a question you might like to ask. You can the see the words waiting yes. to <laughs> emerge. Well, it's actually a question then, and I don't know if you have time to answer it, but it can stay with you both. And that's about the, the, both the coordination bit and the research bit about tackling the social inequality and the equity in developmental outcomes for children and young people through the integration of MHPSS. So I guess it's also about, do we have the evidence? Can we find the evidence? And it speaks directly to what you've just been advocating. Eh? Yeah. I'm going to look at you for evidence. Evidence. <laughs> evidence. <laughs> um, yeah, we talked a bit about it this morning. I think there is very clear evidence that these types of interventions are critical. Uh, the impact of war on children's well-being over time is not just a matter of, well, just is not a good word in this sentence, but it's not only a matter of traumatic events, of bombs, of crossfires, of uh, sexual violence. Uh, war brings a whole system of adversity, and it brings that to the least well-off with the most impact. And that adversity, structurally, gets under the skin. It's from, from pregnancy onwards, um, determines how the brain infrastructure is shaped, determines how you see the world, how you interact with the world, uh, how your parents interact with you, etc. Um, and I think the research on that is quite clear. Uh, toxic adversity, early childhood interventions, the importance of that is, is very clear. What I'm not sure we know so well in, the, in humanitarian settings, per se, is how we push the buttons best in that system. A child lives in a complicated ecosystem, uh, their parents, their teachers, their communities involved. What kind of mix of interventions across different sectors is necessary to most effectively uh, promote well-being across the life course? And if I can answer, I would also say, in addition to, the, to what Pete's comment, it's, uh, it's about the how. And I don't, we're not going to get a one-size-fits-all. I think the pushing the buttons, to use your analogy, is going to be very different if you're sitting in Peru to pushing the buttons if you're sitting in Ukraine or, or in China, for example, for a child development outcome. Um, so I think it's more about being able to, to sit down and do that long-term accompaniment with the government and with multiple ministries that, that need to be supported to be able to work out, you know, your, your, your children in this country and all the ministries that are related to that and the civil society that supports them, how can we best lift that in this particular country, in this context? With all the resource constraints there are, there are countries with extreme resource constraints and huge priorities, so we're not going to get a one-size-fits-all, and it's the how. And that how requires us to have a much stronger capacity at country level or to be able to mentor and work with that capacity at country level better than what we are doing. Um, I think we have enough resources, we have enough evidence, but it's the operationalization of it. It's, that's, that's the creativity, that's the bit that, that's the struggle and that you require, you require people to do that um, at country level, actively doing it to, to be able to put the pieces together and I think that's the challenge. Some of it's financing, but I think even if you had lots of money, we still don't have the right people on the ground. Or we can't identify those people where they are already existing to do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's so much food for thought. We've come a long way, and then we have a situation where the world has turned and revealed what more there is for us to do. So I'm going to put in the last plug within that how is youth engagement and youth with lived experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Thank